So, and, and I, I grew up in a, in a family where there was a, you know, it was totally bilingual. My dad, who you've met, it was a, a francophone, uh, voted PQ all his life, uh, separatist. He didn't vote ON in, in 2012. He totally, that's what I was getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he voted PQ most of his life, all, all his life. And, uh, and where my mom was more leaning towards liberal. And um, so I, I, you know, growing up, I didn't understand politics, but I heard both sides and kind of trying to forge my own idea. I mean, I, as a 12 year old, all, I had a bunch of friends who had Canadian flags and I thought that was cool. And it was really, there was no foundation behind my, my principles, but then growing up um, and getting involved, like, I, I think it was really with the, 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 uh, the Occupy Wall Street moment when that happened in 2011 or 12. Um, and then here we had kind of, uh, we had this whole thing with the, 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 the education system, the Carré Rouge, the, the Carré Rouge the, those red squares that everyone was wearing around the city and yes. around the province. And with, yeah, I, I met all my neighbors cause I was hitting on pots and pans and I, I started paying attention a little more and it seemed like a lot of intellectuals were, 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 were saying that, you know, the, these, these left ideas may be. Um, sovereign ideas of Quebec made sense. And it, like, to me, it kind of clicked. I think I was at that age where I could understand better. And then uh, you came along and that's where, where we were saying my dad eventually voted for Option Nacional because you founded the party uh, back in 2011 or yep. 12? Yeah, 11. Uh, on Halloween day in 2011. And it seemed like it was just in parallel with everything that was going on. It made sense. And you, uh, to this day are the person who many, many in Quebec see as uh, the savior of sovereignty or the person who vulgarizes it the best, who explains it the best. Uh, you've told me personally also that you love, you know, uh, talking to people who never even thought about it, mm -hmm. like in English speaking sectors of like, I don't know, Kirkland or St. Anne de Bellevue or all these places in the West Island where, it, you know, people vote 97 percent just one way and never even think about it. The same way that it happens in French Quebec, where people just always vote PQ, never ask them to tell yeah, questions. Yeah, in some areas. And, and, and they're becoming rare now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it used to be majority PQ. In, in the regions so for for like the average joe like like my myself even i kind i kind of pay attention but i don't understand everything and i love playing devil's advocate but uh w w why is it that um that sovereignty would make sense one I, i'll point out a few of the arguments that are the the banners of what you've explained throughout the years which is um First of all, no country has ever regretted their sovereignty in the history no. of countries, or given it to anyone. It's yeah. it's never happened that nope. that a country be becomes a country all of a sudden and then goes, "Oh shit, bad idea. We should, we should go back to no. become a province or a, a territory." <laughs> no. So that itself, the, why would we regret? There's it? a lot of economic alliances and, and, and treaties, and, and Quebec should do so, even though it's a country or a province. But uh, yeah, once you taste freedom in all the in all the fields also yeah. voting your own laws collecting your own taxes and managing them and signing your own treaties and basically that's the only three parts you need to be a sub well that's country. what i found so seductive about your message was that all all my life it, it seemed like such an emotional um an, an emotional uh thing that people were, were 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 talking about sovereignty and it was like the french against the english it's in français puis you know, it's just une tête carré and all these things that and to me it was like hang on a second but like what are the you know forget like are people focusing too much on language when it comes to the, the you know micromanaging their territory mm -hmm. in, right. in, in a sense like to me the, the language is communication and it makes way more sense to me to say well you know what like california is technically its own country you know they like they think a certain way they, they want to organize a certain way they you know why would we you know how could someone in alberta or in halifax or you know understand what's going on here and the same and vice versa like how could we understand what's what, what the problem in, is in bc it's such a large mass of land to be managed by one government yeah well, i think like, language logically. is language is uh, paramount uh, in the definition of what country you think you belong to? You think so? Oh yeah, and or, or the feeling of belonging to the to the country in question. For instance, the state of New York or the state of California, as you say, <coughs> they could very well be countries on their own and be one of the large, you know, be among the largest and richest countries in the world as mm -hmm. a, as a state or as a country. But they feel American. 
Yeah. They feel American and they, you know, there is a very small fringe of the population in California who would like California to be a country. In Vermont as well, in Maine as well, but it's really marginal. Here in Quebec, I think the, the, the language kind of regroups all of that. Well, in Quebec, the fact that we speak French and the rest of the country speaks English, first of all, will, will determine what culture we, we uh, what cultural content we like. What, to, is, what is our culture? Like well, other than it's definitely really French speaking. And one, one, one point that really uh, where Quebec shines in the world is the local cultural content that we produce yeah. here in Quebec. A, a huge portion of what we we buy and 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 watch and listen to is homemade. Is Quebec made? Mm-hmm. In Canada, it's American made. It's, it's the same cultural content more or less in, in the English speaking provinces and, and the states, which is not a, a crime in itself, but. It really tells a lot about uh, the, the, I think, the, the desire for survival of the French culture in, in North America, and of course, the, I think the language you speak when you grow up will define, at least partly, the way you think. Yeah, you know, in German, the verb comes last in the sentence. You can speak for a few seconds, and you don't really get what the sentence is because the verb comes last in the sentence. I think this structures your brain differently than. Uh, differently from in French, sujet verbe complément. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't th- I, I don't think one is better than the other. But you think differently when you speak a different language. I'm sure about that. And with Japanese and Russian and well, that's this book over here, the language hoax, where they 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 even certain uh, uh, languages don't have a word for blue, but they'll have a word for dark blue and light blue. Yeah. So there's like they do certain tests. It's a book called the language hoax, and they do certain tests with people, and there's like a fraction of a second you know, a quicker response to, they like, yeah, with all these tests of like how to react to a certain color, right. but then, you know, we'll react quicker to something else and where the language really kind of shapes, even if it's like a microsecond or something, but there is a little difference in the way, like you say, if there's well, a I, word for blue. If I believe in that. I believe in that differently. And I'm not a, you know, I'm not Noam Chomsky specialist uh, in languages. In linguistics. Or, yeah, linguistics. And I'm not a psychologist either, but I, I have a lot of friends from, a lot of various countries because yeah. I used to live in, in Europe for seven years total. Well, that's what's interesting because you, oh, sorry. Go, go yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I was just going to say that it shows, you know, among my numerous friends, it shows who comes from the same country and the yeah. way we interact. It, it really defines people. I don't think it defines totally someone. And you could have a Japanese looking very much like a Quebecer in thinking and, and in desires and in values. But I think, generally speaking, it defines uh, nations, the language they speak, or at least it contributes to their definition. And uh, not saying one is superior than the other, but uh, I think Quebec definitely is a distinct society within Canada. And Mm. I think the English-speaking provinces are are more in common with the United States than Quebec has with them. Not to say they're bad neighbors. There is Canadian content. Yeah, there is Canadian content, but uh, a lot of... The cultural content in Canada is, is U.S. made, um, even more so than But in what Quebec. about here in Quebec? Like, if you think about someone, like, right now who's very popular, like Hubert Lenoir. <coughs> yep. I mean, who's obviously singing in French and, and who's an artist that I really enjoy. But to yeah. me, it's he obviously... He was on your show as well, I think, no? Pardon? He was on your show. He was on the show. Um, and he, But, you know, when you listen to it, it's like, okay, well, it's either it's influenced by Steely Dan and, and oh, David course, Bowie yeah. and all these this American and Anglo-Saxon yeah. cultures, but with the language in French. Sure. So is that content, it's basically the language that makes it, defines it as Quebecois content? Well, maybe just for the, you know, the, the lyrics. Of course, the lyrics will be in French, so French people will understand what he sings about. Mm-hmm. But I think it's maybe more visible with comedians. You know, if you ask uh, an Ontarian who's the most famous comedian here, nobody would know Martin Matt or no, no, no. Uh, uh, Louis-José Houd. Whereas in Quebec, they're universally known and, and appreciated. And even I have, <clears throat> I have a few English-speaking uh, friends who were born in Montreal, grew up in Montreal, and don't know who Yvon Deschamps is or Martin Matt is. Yeah. So they, really, the, their culture is uh, English-Canadian and probably uh, American more so than, than uh, uh, you know, cultural content coming from the French-speaking Quebecers. That does not mean that they should not live here. Of course not. But the references go with the language you speak. That, that's my point here. It's not that one is better than the other, but yeah. the, the references are really different according to the language you speak. Yeah, it's always it's always fascinated me that, you know, growing up, it seemed like if, there, if Quebec was to become a country, automatically that would make me or us hate Canada. 
which I thought was completely absurd because I don't, you know, nobody hates any country. No. Like I love Italy and I love Iceland and I love France. Indeed. And, like you love visiting countries. So <clears throat> to have a Quebecois passport and then go visit, you know, Calgary, like I, why would I, you know, get off the plane with rage in my body and hate not, towards yeah. it's like no no it's just a question to me it, it's never been like I, you're saying i get what you're saying with the language but it's always been all the other points that made sense <laughs> to like you know economically or you know um everything you've said but with with uh let me see i have a list here of like just well if we speak about economics uh, there's this term i don't know what it is in english is la péréquation equalization payments so that equalization payments, which is basically what the art, the main argument when, uh, you know, someone will say, well, yeah, but we get a lot of money from the federal yeah. government, right? It's often the so, last argument that will close a discussion. <laughs> yeah. So with that argument, because I, you know, I've, I've worked in Irish pubs and I've, I've, you know, I've had these discussions with, you know, bartenders and with, you know, uh, friends of friends and, and, and people who, you know, aren't really informed politically and that they'll use these myths as an argument. And. I like for you to explain, because that's one of the principal ones that people always use to, yeah. to tell us that, well, you know, you're getting a lot from the Canadian government. So why is that untrue? Well, equalization payments actually is not unique to Canada. Almost every country in the OECD has some form of it. And Canada's equalization payment system is, is one of the least generous. So the proportion okay. of uh, GDP being redistributed <clears throat> is one of the lowest among OECD countries. And... Uh, the illusion that it's a dependence, uh, that, that Quebec depends on equalization payment is really, really strong. Actually, it's really, uh, it got stuck into people's minds and in, in, in the collective mind. But the way it works is that we send about 50, 60 billion dollars of taxes every year out of Quebec. So Quebecers, among the taxes they pay, send up, just to make it simple, half of it out of Quebec. Okay. First of all, no country does that in the world. No country gives its own revenues to the neighbors. Would, would course, this be compared to like the, let's just say in the United States of America, like the state of Vermont paying, is is, is it kind of the same thing, a province? Yeah, there's or? part of it that goes to the federal government to fund uh, federal services, of course. And then in a country where people feel like they belong to the country, they don't complain. It's normal to do that. If Quebec was a country, some regions of Quebec would benefit from economic development in the neighboring regions. And that, that that's all all the same. It's not, uh, but wouldn't not, it's not to say that Texas equalization become, is a bad idea. It's a good idea. Would people from Texas be complaining because, you know, the, if they're doing money with oil and it's sent out to... Well, often the richest provinces or cantons in, in Switzerland or uh, regions in France or departments will complain that they're richer than the rest and they're fed up with paying up for people who, <coughs> they would say, work, work less or are not as rich. But that's universal. It's not unique to Quebec or Canada. But the bad thing about equalization payments here is that people... With time, that argument has made people believe that we were depending on Canada for our social services, yeah. for instance. Whereas in Quebec, we have more social services than anywhere else in Canada, but it's because we pay more taxes than anywhere else in Canada. We mm -hmm. decided socially and collectively to give ourselves this basket of services, and we pay higher taxes, but we have more services. And when, when you calculate after those services, there's more uh, available income uh, disposable income for families in Quebec than anywhere else, uh, almost in Canada. Whereas in the media, you will you will often hear that we are poorer than the rest of Canada. But after tax and after services, <clears throat> the average family gets more for the buck here in Quebec. But that's just too long for a journalist to to explain the whole thing, so yeah. they, they don't they don't do that. But equalization payment, the why I, I say it is an illusion. Of course, if you look just on the accounting side of things, we do receive you know more than ten billion a year. But if you divide by the population, we receive less than any other uh, beneficiary province. <clears throat> because Quebec has 8.5 million people, of course, uh, you know, the, it's, it makes up for a big check. But per person, it, it's, it's you know, lo lower in the table. We were only Ontario, actually, uh, Ontario stopped receiving equalization payment this year. So Quebec is the province uh, which receives uh, you know, the smaller amount of equalization payment per person of course we do receive it but where the illusion lies is that people think that without it would be poorer but the way it works is that we send our economic tools out of the you know, out of the, out of the province i hate the word province and i'll get back to it <laughs> that out of quebec we send billions and billions every year for other people to develop their economy with it and then afterwards they get richer and they say we'll send you a, you know a bit of scrap yeah. money so the they, trickle down effect 
Well, if we might call it that way, we could talk about that as well. But <laughs> the fact is that, of course, if you send your tools to neighbors so that they can better develop their economy, they will, you know, they, they, they'll be likely to be able to send you some, <clears throat> some back afterwards. But if people, you know, if Quebec kept all that money in Quebec and reinvested in, in its, uh, in its uh, strategic sectors like green energies and uh, high tech and, and and artificial intelligence, we would develop our economy so much more than we do now that it would be worth much much more than equalization payments. So yeah. that that's the the contracted con contradictory argument that we depend on Canada. The fact is that we send our tools or our economic levers to Canada. So of course, afterwards they have the you know have a nice role of saying we give back to poor Quebec, but Quebec would be so much richer if it kept all its taxes in Quebec and in invested in Quebec like any other country does. That's interesting. It is, I think, and it's not really well explained in the media <clears throat> because all you see, you know, headlines, Quebec once again receives the largest check. Yeah. So, for, of course, as I said, because of the population, that's the case, but also they don't take the time to explain that if we kept that money here, as any country would do, and developed its own territorial economy we would be so much more uh, we would be much better off economically speaking hmm. we're already quite good actually one of the main obstacle to independence is the comfort we live in in quebec it's it's a it's a blessing to be born in quebec in 2019 of course, yeah. it's, it's one of the best places in the world to live so people saying why why should we change yeah why should we change that but the fact is that <coughs> you should not compare yourself to the worst poorer countries or countries at war or other countries you should compare yourself to your own potential yeah and when you look at all the billions of dollars that we we sent outside of quebec to develop other industries for instance uh, you know there, there is a chantier naval in quebec but we send money to vancouver and halifax to develop their own chantier naval and we don't have one in quebec or when uh, the trudeau government buys a pipeline in bc we send billions of dollars to that because of our proportion of taxes in canada for something that will not give anything to Quebec. And when people say that we depend on tar sands uh, in, in Alberta. Alberta to get our services here, for many, many, many years, we did not use one drop of oil coming from Alberta. We imported it from Europe or the North Sea. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, we don't get much from the, the wealth of Alberta, not at all. Hmm. So and when, for instance, when there was a crisis in the, in the forestry sector in Quebec, was about at the same time uh, when there was a crisis in the auto sector in Ontario, and our billions here in Quebec went out to Ontario to help the automobile sector oh, there, I see. and it almost killed our forestry sector here. So, for as long as we won't be in control of our own economy, we won't be as rich as we could, as prosperous as we could, and that, that that's why we have to convince. That's what we have to convince people of that we'd be better off if we if we use our own money for our own development instead of sending it out for other people to manage it for us. And I've, I've always thought futile to try and, and better other people's ability to manage us. Mm -hmm. like when people say we will reform Canada, we'll make it better for Quebec, why rely on someone else to better manage your life? Why not manage your life yourself like any other country does? And as, as you said, no country in the history of mankind has ever <laughs> wished a neighbor to manage its own affairs. Yeah. So, and, and, and all, you know, that all goes back to the, the question why should Quebec separate? Uh, on the economic side, I think it's quite clear. <clears throat> on the cultural side, I think no one will, you know, no one will argue with the fact that uh, Quebec legislators are better placed to, to to protect French and promote it than Saskatchewan uh, elected officials. Or mm -hmm. so it, it's an, an obvious one as well. And I'm I'm quite sure that in 1980 and 1995, people who voted no uh, in the referendums. Some of them voted no because they love Canada, of yeah. course. But I think a majority of those people voted no because they had some questions, some fears. Yeah, they were, some they were afraid of change some or, or instability. Yeah. yeah, some uncertainties. <coughs> yeah, towards a... Which is totally legitimate. Oh, I mean, of course. I, I it mean, is. If, if it's not well explained or well... It is. Why, it, why is it that there's no one who is, um, you know, uh, who, who is, is uh, agile with English could could ever explain this like what well, how come it's never happened that there's someone who, who you know is some i guess bright economist or 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 or, or political with figure. glasses and gray hair exactly oh, okay. yeah. uh, <laughs> who, who who just came out and 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 explained it in a very simple very you know well, clear, if it makes so much sense like why are people still reluctant or 
why maybe the message didn't get through because I'm convinced that English speaking Quebecers would be better off in a sovereign Quebec that, you know, that's uh, my that's my main question also is is like for someone who like in my family on, on, on one side of the family everyone is is Anglo and they live in the West Island and some of them don't speak French at all or very little and they've been here all their life and yeah. and and which is you know th that's debatable too like you know if, if do, you, do you really need to learn French and all that stuff but um, yes yeah, so, so why why is it that still there uh, you know the vote is completely one-sided and how yeah. come the 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 sovereignist uh, message didn't come through like what 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 is the advantage to an english-speaking quebecois to, you, to separate what, maybe what, the media did not relay french content to the english masses and, and mm -hmm. vice versa because i think french-speaking people in quebec are not that much aware of uh, the english-speaking community's uh, worries and and doubts but uh, you know anyone living in quebec will be better off in a more prosperous quebec including newcomers from last week and english-speaking people here for 10 generations so it's it's mathematical. So how how do you explain to someone living you know in Kirkland that no no it would be better for you? I mean, well first of all we have to you know reassure them that their rights will be totally respected, which has always been the case in the sovereignist movement. No prime minister from Parti Québécois because it's the only sovereignist party to have been in power. No leader ever suggested that the rights of the English community, the, the historic English community, should be reduced. No one has done that and. No one has thought about that because it would be nonsense. You know, th this community has contributed that that much and that well to what Quebec is right now. Of that course, all their rights would be uh, respected, including, of course, the right for you know, to have English schools and uh, and culture and everything. So, once you can alleviate that worry, the rest is just usual arguments, just just like with anyone else, French speaking, Spanish speaking, or English speaking. You know, if if we keep our economic tools here in Quebec. Just like Canada does for Canada and the states do, do for state for the states and Mexico does for Mexico, once we do that, we'll be more prosperous and anybody living on a territory will be more, more prosperous and benefit from it. So, but we first have to reassure them. I think that their rights will would be totally uh, protected, which they would. I, I have no doubt about that. Well, one thing that seems to come up. I have a friend of mine who's who's uh, French from France. She immigrated here and has her business. And her her uh, boyfriend is is English from Ontario, and they they recently had a, a baby son, and they they you know they're starting to they, they voted at the last election, and they were really really paying attention to all the parties, and they were kind of you know I think they voted in yet maybe QS mm -hmm. uh, because but at the same time they found it it seemed like every platform was pushing for your child to learn French absolutely to go to French school. It was like if, mandatory. If you're a newcomer, and I, I totally agree with that. You know, people from immigration who come to Quebec, if they don't already speak French, I think they should learn and study in French when they're young so that they can better integrate in, into the vast majority well, of people in Quebec. What if the parents, like what, one parent is English, uh, or what, one parent is French, one parent is English, and still they have to send their, like, isn't it more important as like I guess in a globalized world, like we're living more and more, to learn whether it's Mandarin or mm -hmm. English first, just to function in the world and not just be. I'm playing devil's advocate. Right yeah, now. yeah. Or, or that's an argument. That I think comes you're quite devilish here because nobody would say that you you need to learn English because it's the lingua franca in the world before the, the own language in your community in the local community. Mm -hmm. And I think the future of mankind lies in in the fact that we will. You know, we will regroup locally with smaller communities. I, I don't mean to raise barriers or, or walls, uh, of course not. But I think we have to go local much more than global now because the planet is going to hell. Economic development is going to hell as well because wealth is being concentrated in a few pockets because of globalization. So I think it's even more important than it was in the past to be locally, uh, locally uh, involved. rooted. Yeah, involved and rooted. So I, I think it's of the utmost importance for newcomers here in Quebec to learn French as their as their communicational language with the majority. That way it will function as a society. If we learn English because everybody in the world speaks English, they still live in Denmark and Japan and, and South Africa. So we don't see them. It's nice to speak English when you travel, but when you live in Quebec, you should be able to do your own life in French because it's a French speaking society. And of course, and as Jacques Parizeau said, anybody in Quebec who goes out of uh, the fifth secondary school year and is not bilingual should deserve a little slap on the hand <laughs> or a kick in the butt, he said. 
because it's so easy here to learn English and English is the new Latin. So it's, it, it is the international language. So it's, of course, it's, it's a, it's a good tool to have uh, to speak English, but I think people who come here and do not speak French should learn French to integrate. The difference with uh, the historic English community in, in Quebec is that they have a right to live and raise their, their kids in English and they keep that right right now. And they would keep that right in a, in a sovereign Quebec, I'm convinced. So we have English schools mm -hmm. and it should be for those people who come from the historic English speaking community. But new people coming to Quebec, I think, should integrate in French because the vast majority of Quebecers are French speaking. Mm. So it, and it makes sense as well, because mathematically, if we always you know, leave it, leave it to anyone to choose what language they want to speak. You know, Louisiana is not that far from Quebec. I, I'm quite sure French will slowly disappear if, if everybody has a choice because some French-speaking people would like to send their kids to the English school as well because they would be of better course. equipped for the rest. But the thing is that when you, when you go to school in English all your life, you will often find a boyfriend or a girlfriend who's English-speaking. Mm -hmm. You will find a job in English as well. And that, that's, that slowly makes French, uh, you know, go back and uh, backwards and backwards uh, every day more so i think uh, the demographics of quebec and, and and the dynamics of immigration makes it even more important that we be very very prudent on, on the protection of french and uh, bill 101 was i think a necessity at the time even english-speaking people i'd say of goodwill recognize that it was a you know a necessity for for french to yeah. survive in quebec so i think we should still have laws that you know the word force is not really nice but laws that make it so that people coming to quebec will be schooled in, in french and you, you you think i'm being the devil right now you're quite devilish <laughs> um quite devilish <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna go even further in being devilish and i'm gonna i'm gonna look at this from a macro level from a, a universal level and, and and zoning out of the planet but and i, and I, I don't think Should this speak martian is that it? <laughs> I, I don't think this necessarily but i I'm, I'm asking the question because i think it's it's important to ask what would happen if uh, French was eventually eradicated yeah. and, you know, we were assimilated, let's just say, if we use that word, or where eventually it's just, oh, well, people stop speaking French the same way that other languages have, been, have kind of disappeared throughout the past and human beings here on this little part of the planet end up speaking, you know, some form of English or if, I don't know, maybe Chinese one day or Spanish, or if there's just one universal language, because in the end, language is really communication. Yes, it's culture, but it's, it's it is culture. It, it, it's really like if I like I've been to Shanghai and I, I obviously I speak French and English, but over there they don't speak English. There's there's hardly anybody who speaks English unless they're business driven. But if I was in a restaurant, there was no way of asking for water. Yeah. But I still had like that was the beautiful thing of kind of having to mime and kind of, you know, pointing at the menu and. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> it is fantastic. And, that, and that's what I'm saying in the end. Like, isn't language just a tool to, like, get a glass of water, you know, eat, eat a bite of food, get some shelter, like, show that you're cold, like, well, I, I whether think, it's in Russian or in English <coughs> or in Portuguese. I think the fact that the American sledgehammer is not stronger in the culture world, uh, worldwide uh, is because of different languages. Uh, the day we all speak the same language around uh, around the, the world, world. Uh, you know, natively speaking only one language, uh, cultural diversity will will just go to hell. There will be one content coming from Hollywood, and everybody will have the same culture, the same reflexes. Or or Shanghai, or Shanghai, maybe. Although I think Mandarin is too complex a language to ever become dominant in the world. You think? Oh, of course, they don't even have an, an <clears throat> alphabet, organized alphabet. It's it's just too too tough to learn. So I, I don't think uh, Mandarin, Mandarin will ever take over English as the world language. Actually, you know what language will be first in 2100, in 2100? I don't. French, because of Africa. Oh. Demograph, demographs have predicted that the, the dominant language in about uh, 70 years from now, 80 years from now, will be French. So for Quebecers who think it's a hindrance to speak French and that we're just weaker because of that, well, it's the opposite. It's going to be a huge tool and a huge advantage to to be native in the dominant language in the world. So That's people really should know that. Yeah. Africa and, is booming. Uh, demographically and I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna keep being the devil here and and <laughs> and um, <Va> retro. <laughs> and obviously there's uh you've mentioned this before where we are here in quebec the saudi arabia of natural resources yeah. that we're very rich in natural resources especially in water which is probably a reason why we're richer than 90 percent of the countries 
around the world. Yeah. So we would do fairly well as a sovereign country. With one hand tied. With one because hand tied. Because we're just a province. Because <laughs> we're just a province. <laughs> um, so what about, you know, obviously there, there's there's talk more and more, I think more like in, in, in the dark web and all this of like climate wars eventually becoming something. Because right now, obviously, we're fighting for oil and yeah. all these wars are created because of petrol. and <clears throat> But eventually, uh, if there's a drought somewhere, people need to move and yeah. and and the whole i guess uh, end game is 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 going somewhere where you can have all these natural resources um i mean even if we get our shit together over here yeah. like as a, as a as a country or province or whatever you want to call it this this little mass of land um if the if the <coughs> province or country or territory next door doesn't get their shit together where whether, whether it's with climate change or you know like pollution and and you know concentrating on the automobile or the petrol industry as opposed to the forest industry and all that uh you know the the the, the frontiers or the the um the lines the imaginary lines we have cannot yeah. stop that from coming over and you mean could we be invaded for water well could we be invaded for water could we be could, could uh yeah i mean people well, need, need to move there in. are a few answers even to if that. we say no it's first like, first of all province or country if we have to be invaded for water we will be Canada cannot protect us more than we yeah. could. And I think no country in the world in their right mind would invade a neighboring country to the United States. And if the United States tried to invade us, what can we do? They're just too big and too strong. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's not even rational to worry about that because whether we're a country or a province, if people want to water and want to attack us, the only one who could protect us is the States. And yeah. if the States want to invade us, we're, we're done. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we'll we'll come to that, and I think a you know an independent Quebec would have a much big you know, thanks to water we have here would have a much heavier weight diplomatically than its population in the world. We're eight point five million. It's an average country. We're more populous uh, than most countries in the world. You know there are more countries with fewer people, fewer yeah. people than more people. So we're not a small people. We often hear Quebec is a small people. We're you know at worst. An average people, not, not a small yeah, yeah. one, but uh, you know our weight diplomatically would be much stronger because of all the resources we have here, because of the creativity we have here. You know, for a population our size, we produce more culture or more cultural products or content than, than anywhere else. A whole in the world. lot of talent coming out of Quebec. It's incredible the creativity here, and I'm new. I'm a newcomer to the video game business. The uh, the inventiveness is that a word? Inventiveness. Uh huh. Yeah of uh, quebecers is is renowned all over the world it's not a, it's not a you know of course tax credits helped but it's not a surprise that all the big video game companies in the world and you know, got some some presence here in montreal because uh, you know quebec uh, quebec creators and, and workers are are renowned all over the world not only because they're bilingual but because of their creativity so quebec has a lot of uh you know a lot of uh, advantages or uh, benefits to its own creativity and, and, and cultural production so I, I just to get back to the natural resource thing we would be seen in the world as a let's say a, a provider of good things much more than negative things and and the world itself you know the, for instance at the united nations there are not too many rational voices when they go to a vote or to a debate i think quebec as a country would be of course better for quebecers themselves but also for the whole planet they would have one more reasonable voice in all the debates on the, the environment on a specific war or on, on any social or global issues quebec would more often than otherwise be on the right side of things you know because I, I don't think it's uh, and we would so, probably agree with canada on most things on most things yes i mean uh, maybe not the oil international maybe not oil because canada is a petrol state now and quebec has no advantage in, in oil at all because we don't produce any and our strength, economically speaking and strategically speaking, is in green energies. We're a powerhouse in green energies worldwide, yeah. but the billions of taxes we send out go to finance oil. It's mm -hmm. a nonsense. You know, that's one example of why sovereignty. And is. everyone knows that it's the future. I mean, the, the, you could create so many jobs if there's you're going physical towards solar. End. And yeah, there's a physical end to oil. We know it's going to be over in, in a few decades. So the first country to, to be able to run its economy without oil We'll be able not only to be very prosperous with that, but export its technologies and, and, and help the world survive, actually help humanity survive. And I think for as long as we send billions out of Quebec to develop oil uh, sites, we don't contribute to the world in a positive way. And we would if we were independent because our, our own strategic 
advantage in energies is to develop green energies. That's what we have here. It's our natural, natural um, equipment, actually. Mm -hmm. Isn't and, and you know, all around the world, obviously, I guess because of the contrast with Donald Trump and everything, everyone looks over to Canada yeah. with Justin Trudeau. Uh, as as this you know incredible you know uh, good looking uh, intelligent it depends on taste uh, <laughs> <laughs> but everyone seems to see him as such an example and such a say like worldwide every every time I go to the U S went to Chicago go yeah. to you know L A anywhere they'd be like oh you guys are so lucky you have Justin Trudeau well that's the effect of uh, yeah everything is relative of course his look PR at is incredible yeah. and, you know he, he everyone uh, you except know, in India. <laughs> Like, like, uh, exactly. But, but people like, you know, Jimmy Fallon will talk about just yeah. Trudeau like such, oh my God, look what they're doing next door. So, nice. but what, what, what is this, this illusion that we're missing out on? Like you were talking about all the, the pipelines and all that, like, is it possible for Canada one to get their shit together? Uh, you know, um, on like, you know, you're, we're saying, well, we would like to go towards the renewable energy and all that. But what if somebody came along and, and got it together? And then two, what is the, this illusion that Trudeau is creating that in the end that, that there is a lot of you know behind the scenes kind of manigance happening well it's not an illusion of a, he ran on a, a green platform and he's he's developing tar sands and all the, all the oil sites in, in canada as much as he can because it, it's a reality any country which possesses oil will develop it will uh, will try and make money with it and if quebec had oil uh, the way uh, saudi arabia has it, it, it would have uh, rigs everywhere and we would be uh, oil exporters so I, I don't think they're bad people it's just that <coughs> it's such an easy way to make money today and they want to maybe translate it into public services locally for those who have oil so we cannot blame them for that although with the climate crisis i think we can start and blame people who still develop new oil sites instead of investing the same money in green energies is that what we're trying to do with anticosti or or do with no, actually, the plan and all i think anticosti was a mistake <laughs> and not only strategically with people who are uh, you know who who find it very important to to protect the environment especially the younger generation but also you know quebec has a lot of potential in not only hydroelectricity which we're all already a world leader in hydroelectricity, but also in wind power and, and solar power, uh, biomass, bioenergy. We have everything here to develop everything besides oil. So, and as I said earlier on, we, we send tens of, you know, tens of billions of dollars every year in taxes outside of Quebec so that Canada can develop its petro state. So it's not only against our own interest here in Quebec, but it's against the planet's interest. If that money was invested in green energies, we, we would be so much more closer or advanced and so much closer to having an economy that runs without oil. And that will have to come one day. So why not develop it now? And we could be a leading example we that would other be countries sure. would, would uh, yeah. We would be for sure. China is actually leading the way in green energies. It might be strange to say, but they have a lot of money and they invest in it. But uh, Quebec could be a beacon of green energies and green technologies and it would help the whole planet. But in order to do that, we have to keep our own taxes here and invest in our own strategies and our own strategic sectors, which we don't, we cannot do now because the, the economic money we send out is used by another state with other priorities. And Canada's priority right now is to export uh, Alberta's oil. So, it, it so you're so it. you're saying for for an, an English speaking person living in 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 Quebec who's doing his thing right now, um, and who's always all his life been con kind of conditioned or taught to fear the sovereignist or the separatist movement, these people have nothing to worry about. I, economically speaking, no. And I think on, uh, on the right to live in English side, they should not be worried either. Of course, I understand the, the feeling that they would, back, they would become a minority in their, own, in their own new country, much like Quebec is now a minority in Canada. But I don't think they should worry about it because the experience we've had so far is that even with PQ governments or with sovereignist government, nobody, uh, you know, nobody reduced the English speaking community's right to live in English here and nobody questioned it. The only thing they should worry about is their judgment if they root for the Boston Bruins instead of uh, <laughs> Habs, because a lot of them do. <laughs> so for, uh, there, there's a you know, very prominent figure who is now past uh, Pierre Falardeau back in yeah. the day, who once, you know, very openly criticized uh, Quebec Solidaire. Yeah. Who, who was just never thought that uh, sovereignty would go through that vehicle, who thought it the left would not bring sovereignty to Quebec and, and, and was very, very highly critical of mm -hmm. it. Um, 
and it seemed like even you, you, you had, uh, you were, you founded Option Nationale yeah. and it lasted a few years, had a good run and it was the kind of, a, uh, independent party out of the main four, main three. Um, so if, 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 if uh, Quebec Solidaire is just like extreme left, let's just say, and in, in Quebec terms, yeah, in Quebec yeah. terms, um, do do we see a, a vehicle eventually a pol political party um making sense or, or 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 that's a bit more like what what does quebec need basically is my question like does, well, does it need something that's you know, more central does it need some that that's I, like, where i agree totally with falardo is that uh, a party which puts left leaning policies before independence will not realize independence okay i think it's because you need to you need to convince everybody <coughs> and yeah. then as and, you once said Uh, from what I understand, is that a country become uh, you know a territory becomes a country, and then it's going to keep debating about left oh, and right for the like rest every of every other country in the exactly, world. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. You know, France alternates between uh, you know center right and center left. The states do. Germany does. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it's, it's going to be a normal country in Quebec, and we'll probably alternate between center right and center left. But the thing is that when when you tell people, "I want to give you your freedom," but it's going to be on the left. There's a huge contradiction there that you impose a condition <clears throat> to freedom, which is not freedom. And I think before you before you decide whether you will be on the left or on the right, you have to get the power to decide. Mm -hmm. And right now we could elect a left-leaning government in Quebec and a right-leaning government in Canada would just come in a position to a lot of policies and be counterproductive. So you have to get the tools to decide yourself whether you'll be on the left or on the right, and that's called sovereignty. And actually... In French, it's it, it, it's a way of saying it, but uh, in English, it, I, I wouldn't know how to translate it. But avant d'être à gauche ou d'être à droite, il faut être. Mm -hmm. So before, as of now, we're not a country. Before being on the left or on the side, you have we, to be. We need to be. Yeah, you need to exist. Or you know. I see. But uh, yeah, so I, I have a lot of friends at Quebec Solidaire. But historically speaking, that country has had, that, that party, sorry, has had a lot of internal debates on sovereignty, which to me doesn't meet the need doesn't show uh, that this party is first of all sovereignist. You know when you have to debate internally whether your constituent will be for sovereignty or something else, it's a sign to me that it was not uh, and actually it's a fact that Quebec Solidaire was not founded for sovereignty. It was founded for the left-leaning policies mm -hmm. that people wanted in Quebec, some people wanted in Quebec. <clears throat> so I think if there was to be a referendum tomorrow in Quebec, Quebec Solidaire would split. Uh, between the, the the yes camp and the no camp, because there's a lot of uh, members of Quebec Solidaire who are uh, outspoken federalists. Of course, uh, I think a majority of them would vote yes, but a lot of uh, Quebec Solidaire uh, members would vote no. So you know, a, a party which would split in two in a referendum or a sovereignty <coughs> debate cannot be the leading vehicle for the idea, because it was split based on the idea. So I think Quebec needs a, a party. Uh, whose first and foremost idea will be that of making Quebec a country with, of course, probably a few propositions in, in terms of environment, education, health, etc. But they should be as generic as possible so that some left-leaning people might not want to vote something else because it's too right-leaning or, or the opposite. So I think, you know, a bit like Option Nationale was, he was definitely outspoken in favor of independence and it had some sections on the economy, on health, uh, education, etc. But it was, you know, it, it did not frighten a right-leaning guy or girl to vote for Option Nationale because of its positions. It, 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 I think it really tried to attract people based on sovereignty, and we need to do that. And we need to have such a vehicle in Quebec, whether it's, you know, the existing parties that reaffirm their, themselves a bit more or a new vehicle that... Sees the, it just seems like the, the the message is not getting across, or the communication skills are. are, are well, I'd say right now it, it's understandable because even the PQ over the last few years was quite soft on sovereignty, and, and it's a fact that it's easier in Quebec to get elected without talking about that. Exactly, because yeah. it's such a huge thing to you know to build a new country or but separate. It's so simple to explain, <coughs> and so but simple to. I, I to, think to, it is, but you know for. For and it needs to be explained in English. It needs to be explained yeah. in French. It needs to be explained in Spanish. And for, for newcomers, it needs to be explained in as many languages Just, as hey, possible. Hey, guys, it makes sense. You know, something that really impressed me is in Scotland, the referendum. Mm. The newcomers voted yes almost at the same rate as the local uh, born there for generations. So they, they really could do something 
that we could not in Quebec, which is get through this barrier of a newcomer <coughs> and explain to them the, the, you know, the benefits of being sovereign in Scotland in their case. But in Quebec, I'm, I'm convinced that if we, uh, if we try more and explain better to English communities why an independent Quebec would be better off for them, better for them. I don't think we'll get 75% of them voting yes, but we'll get more of them voting yes. And the worst mistake we could make is to, to think ahead of talking to them that it's lot wasted time because they won't want to hear about it. I think the only thing we should do is go to them and talk to them about it. Of course, talk to the majority French speaking as well, but uh, talk to all the minorities, minorities in Quebec as well, because this project could not be more collective. Mm -hmm. It's not a French-speaking project to have Quebec as a country. It's a collective project for anyone who lives in Quebec. And to me... That's the exciting part. Well, to me, it, a Quebecer it, is it, anyone together, who lives in Quebec. Let's do this. Like. Yeah, and, and if I was a newcomer in Quebec, I'd be so proud to put in my CV, co-founder of a country. Mm -hmm. I would really work for that sovereignty for sure. And actually, when I was at Option Nationale, we had a few sessions with newcomers. You know, some people had arrived the week before, some others uh, you know, over the course of the last year. And we talked to them in very slow French because they were still learning language uh, of all the benefits of sovereignty. And sometimes we had a little fun vote at the end, who would vote for independence. And some nights, a majority of people voted yes, of course, it was a simulation. But, uh, and, and there was not a federalist beside, beside me just to, to try and scare them with the usual shit. But uh, no, I, I think it's very possible to you know, get more, uh, more of a... <clears throat> Soutien, more support, more support. Yeah, thanks. More support from those communities that we don't have now. If we talk to them and explain them pragmatically why Quebec would be better off, a lot of them. Well, most of the time, they, they don't have time to think about this. I mean, they just you know left a country that's in bombardment and war yeah. and, and and famine. Or, and that's understandable. Even and I mean, you get here, you're just glad <laughs> to have a glass of water. Oh, <laughs> but even uh, native Quebecers don't have time to think about it, and uh -huh, you know yeah. they're too busy watching La Voix. Or, or going on with their lives with the kids, with uh, you, know, uh, you know, repairing that that, that part of that other part of part the of the house, house yeah. or uh, you know, that people have busy lives. Even kids have busy lives now. So you know, some people say sovereignty will come when the people, you know, grassroots movement will will ask for it. I think it's the role of political leaders to have people want it. If if you abdicate that leadership and you say when people ask for it, we'll give them a country. I think you shouldn't be politics, and that that goes for any type of uh, you know involvement. In my case, it was for sovereignty. Those who go for the environment should be the same. You know, we, could you imagine the Green Party saying, "Vote for us," and in the first mandate, we won't do anything for for the environment, but in the second one, we'll just yeah. work. People would laugh at it. So, uh, you know, a so-called sovereignist party, which would say, "Vote for us," but we won't do anything for sovereignty, is just as laughable to me. You have to, you have. To show you, tell your convictions clearly, and and be okay with the result of the election. So, if people vote for something else because they don't want what you propose, you should accept it and do something else with your life. But it's become so easy to just talk about something else, even though it's your you know basic raison d'être in, in the party. It's so it's so easy to talk about something else to have a better chance of at being elected. That a lot of people do that. Not not all of them, of course. But a lot of PQ leaders have done that. It was easier to get elected without talking about sovereignty, and they they chose not to talk too much about it or to say that it will postpone it. Yeah, maybe one day. Well, and they're all as sovereignist as I am, I'm sure. But I think what the movement lacked in the most recent years is the courage to say that's where I want to take Quebec. If you, you know, well, if their message was if, clear and made sense, I mean, it's it, it's you know that's the thing that was so appealing. But from a, you know someone like Bernie Sanders was that he hammered the same message over and over. And every oh. time you see him for the past three years, that's now, the way people will he's remember. He's just it. been repeating, and people make fun of him. And like the, uh, Saturday Night Live will make a sketch about it. But in the end, I mean, the, if you talk about Bernie Sanders, you could clearly state his five main ideas, and it's just you know taxing the wealthy, the one percent, and uh, one percent, and, and, and the one percent, and uh, you know we make gotta make education free for everybody, and we got it like I well, mean. But, that those are but the catchphrases. People remember it, and yeah. the, the 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 message is so bloody clear. Yeah. Well, I'm working on a small book for uh, equalization payments, so that people will 
and it needs to we'll be in stop English. Too. Being scared of, of of you know of losing equalization payments, but we wouldn't lose anything. We would gain all the taxes we send out. I had but, a friend of mine who who you know who, who's who's English. My friend James, who you know, yeah. once said, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the party seriously the day that their website is even translated in English." The PQ is, that is. Well, oh. back in the day, it was Option Nationale ah, or Quebec okay. Solidaire. Or, yeah. There's no. Uh, there, there was no um, website of any party that even so. No wonder someone living in, probably the Liberal Party has a bilingual sign. Of course, well that that's probably why yeah. they you know they get a, they they well, feel it, like yeah, they're yeah. concerned. You know, is there a natural clientele? I would say, but, uh, but I feel the most important thing if you, we were to rally everyone together. Hey guys, let's make let's make a country yeah. together. Everybody, you're Haitian, you're English, you're Japanese. Like let's do this. You know, well, and, uh, and it would need to you know, people would need to feel like they're they're important in this movement and they're part of it. And in Absolutist case, forgotten. I I can confirm you that our goal was to have it in the main three languages of the continent, which is English, Spanish, and French, of yeah. course, because we're in Quebec. But we didn't have the time or the resources to do that. But uh, the goal was like to have it half multi- a percent of the vote. Multilingual. We had 2% of the vote in 2012, but uh, that was a miracle because we founded a, a sovereignist party just beside a sovereignist party that, that was you know, going to power. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the dynamics at the time was that uh, there was no room for another party because the big one was going to power. If Option Nationale was founded today, it would be very different because... What 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 used to be called the uh, you know the vaisseau amiral is is quite in, in bad shape right now. They're not going to power anytime soon. They're you know they had seventeen percent of the vote actually we had because I ran with them. What's the vaisseau? What sorry? Vaisseau amiral. What's that? The le- well the leading vessel. Oh I see okay. Yeah, in French it's called vaisseau amiral. So you know in two thousand and twelve the dynamics was that it, it was going to power and it did. Whereas now it's it's you know it's questioning its, its own future. So if Option National was founded today instead of eight years ago, yeah, I think results could be quite different. You've traveled all around the world. You've lived in different parts of the mm-hmm. world. Uh, where are some like you've lived in London and in Spain as well? You've lived in for Spain. seven years total. Have you lived anywhere else? In Birmingham in the UK, Birmingham. Okay. Yeah. But but you've also traveled around the world for yeah, for work yeah. and I've for been to maybe a bit more than 40 countries. Okay. So that that's what's really interesting to me is that you've been all around the world. You're very, you know, very intelligent person, very uh, you, you follow culture, you you're 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 implicated now in video games and all this stuff and you've seen uh you've spent some time uh, elsewhere than in Quebec. Whereas, you know, sovereignty in general is seen as such a small minded thing or whatever it's, it's someone who's been all around and then comes back and go, "Hey guys, it's still a good idea." makes is very appealing of course it's still a good idea and everywhere i go you know some people do not understand why a canadian would like to split from canada because they think canada is english speaking all the way so some people even educated people outside of canada a lot of them do not know that there's a french-speaking province in mm-hmm. in, in canada they do not know that it's one of the <coughs> one of the so-called founding peoples of, of canada you know of course there were a lot of people here before europeans arrived but in, in modern Canada, you know, the, the English speaking and French, and, and French speaking yeah, uh, guys are seen as co-founders of what Canada is today. But a lot of people, even educated ones, do not know that reality. So when you talk a bit about that case to them, they, they become much more open to the idea. But one thing I noticed, though, when I lived elsewhere or travel elsewhere, if you open the daily newspapers, they have the exact same issues as in Quebec, no? Leaking school roofs, uh, too long to wait in the hospital when you have a little a little problem. So you know, I, I come to that because some people say that Quebec should first resolve its own internal problems and then think about becoming a country. We have the same issues as any other country has. So we'd have the same questions as any Western country you know, or looking like 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 looking country, but. Uh, I've never seen anywhere in the world something that we lacked to become a country from what I saw on the ground in other countries. And even, I would even say that we have much more than what they have. And when you said we're richer than 90% of the countries already as a province, I can only imagine what it would be if we had kept all our fiscal tools to develop our own industries here in Quebec. We'd be so much more prosperous. And the, and the fact that all those countries, they protect jealously their independence of course, they sign economic treaties, and Europe is a you know, a bundle of almost thirty countries doing trade together. But no laws in Denmark is decided by France, and no tax in England is is collected mm-hmm. by Greece. So it, it's really different. It's a set, it's a a group, a bunch of independent countries, which do business together. That's yeah. exactly what Quebec would do. 
and independence doesn't mean aut autarky. You know, the only doesn't mean what? Sorry, autarky so being just uh, by yourself, the frontiers closed. Oh, I see, yeah. So it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you manage your own interdependencies in the world because all, all the countries depend on trade with others mm -hmm. and Quebec would be the same, but at least it would decide how to manage those relationships and would, would decide what treaty to sign. Right now, all the treaties that involve Quebec with the rest of the world are decided by Canada with Canada's interests in mind. And we touched a bit uh, on it earlier on. The economic or industrial interests of Canada are, are vastly divergent to, to those of, of Quebec. So we're not we're not no we're not well uh, well covered by the current system in Canada. And what what is the because um, it seems to me like I, I lately I've been I've been uh, kind of I realized I was kind of I was very very left leaning, and then more and more so with as time goes by like I, I as I, I read books and I educate myself and I listen to different political podcasts and and stuff like that I. I realize that it's way, it's far more nuanced and it yeah. seems like it's easy to get it, you know, lost in our echo chambers and with, you know, Facebook and course, fake news. Algorithms and all stuff. helping. Algorithms like just feeding what you want to hear and all that stuff. But what is something that like someone who's, I, I guess ma for the majority, I, I am left leaning, but what are, what are some of the, 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 cause the left needs the right and the right needs right. the left, right? That's kind of the idea, like keeping each other in check. What are, what are the things that, um, that the, the right does well or not does well but, but it, it totally makes sense i and, think it's, and it's, yeah. it's it's important that you know it's not all completely left and it's not all completely right like there are some good ideas on the right i think it's all based on stereotypes actually because you know the, the biggest stereotype is that the heart lies with the left and the efficiency lies with the right mm -hmm. if you look at recent years you know left-leaning governments have had better finance public uh, public finances uh, management than uh, right winning uh, in the states. The Republicans are vastly worse than the Democrats lately to to manage uh, the balance of uh, public finances. And uh, I think it's all based on stereotypes because a lot of right leaning people, you know, put a lot of importance to social services. And I would say everybody on the left wants the public finances to be managed uh, and have an equilibrium, uh, have a balanced budget. <coughs> So I think we, all we have to propose the population is common sense policies. For instance, take uh, free tuition. You you mentioned for Bernie Sanders uh, free schooling. So free school, which was one of your main of points in your platform. And it would what, be so from so, kindergarten to doc to PhD. Exactly. So so someone who who's not too well informed and says, oh yeah, but you know it's like free education. Uh, it costs so much more in the well, states, and, yes. and and we're so lucky here and all this stuff. And again, yeah. not to compare ourselves to worse places, yeah. but. What, why is it so advantageous to well, be paying for school for everybody? But I would, yeah, I know the answer, but I want you to explain. But the thing is, <coughs> this policy <coughs> is seen as a left-leaning policy. You know, free tuition, left-leaning is a go gauche. Uh, but the thing is that if you have a right-leaning brain, economic brain, you should love that policy because when schooling is free in any field, mm -hmm. on average, people go you know, a few years or a little bit longer to school so they have a better training. And that just it's not just for PhDs. It could be for a plumber, for an electrician, for anything that's technical as well. So on average, there's one, you know, one less barrier to going on with your studies. So on average, people go longer. So they have higher salaries when they get out of yeah. school. And the taxes you collect on those higher salaries are worth more than the tuition fees you canceled. But you have to have the wheel turning a little bit before that happens because training takes a few years. So five, ten years down the road, you have more fiscal entries than you would have with the current system. So a government with long-term vision, a government with the collective interest in mind, will go for that policy. A government who only sees the budget this year or the next election will be afraid of, of cutting tuition because it, it's going to be a little hole in the budget for you know some years before the uh, additional fiscal entries can come in so or, or the additional fiscal collection comes in so if you have a short-term view you will see that as too costly if you have a long-term view, view you will see all the benefits of that policy of course socially economically and also environmentally on the health side you know a more educated population is more responsible environmentally they eat better they train a little more so th there's a lot of correlation with with the uh, the general degree of instruction or education of a population and the responsible actions of that population. So the benefits of free tuition 
down the road from CPE to doctorate or PhD is, is, is many fold and a long-term vision government would see that. And I really look forward to the day we'll have that in Quebec because it, it, it has only benefits on all, on all sides. And what about those who would argue that people would get their education here then go elsewhere? Because that seems to be a problem, well, right? That's what's called the like balisé. In, in medicine? Uh, is, oh, that, in, is that happening a lot? Like where fields, doctors will go elsewhere? Yeah, to... In some fields. But you, you can always put... Uh, what we had at uh, Option Nationale was gratuité scolaire balisé. So it was uh, balise. Uh, it's like... Um, you know, limited, no, not limited. No, but, but there, there were, we had some some conditions on it. For instance, if you're a foreigner, you'd have to either stay here and have a few years of services to get that for free. Otherwise, you pay your education. Mm -hmm. Same goes for, uh, you know, a native Quebecer who would, would like to have uh, five bachelor's degrees and never go to work. Because the, the idea beside behind uh, free tuition is that when, once you get your training, your services, your skills... <clears throat> and of course, the tax you pay, the taxes you pay will more than compensate for what society gave you. So if your goal in life is to be an eternal student and never give a society, I think you should pay part of your tuition or your education. And if your goal is to come to Quebec for three years, have a bachelor's and, and go back to your country, you should pay part of your education, of course, or all your education, education actually. But uh, it's called gratuité scolaire balisé. That makes sense. I would even have some entry tests. You know, I would have loved to be a ballet dancer, but I don't have the skills for that at all. So I don't think society should pay for me to train as a ballet dancer <laughs> if it's just for my own pleasure. Is that really what you want to do? No. It's just a, an illustration. I understand. As an economist, I was okay. I would have probably passed easily the entry test. <laughs> so it would have made sense for society to to give me that training for free because, you know, if you go on to the PhD, you'll have a higher salary, you'll pay more taxes, and you will more than reimburse what it costs society for your training. Um, even yeah, on top of that, as I said, the skills, the better skills you'll have will be very good for society and, and you know, everything else follows. So I think uh, gratuité scolaire is the best idea we could implement. And what would it mean for, because obviously, you know, we're to, you talk about, you know, Quebec becoming a country with all, with all these people living here and, and let's do this all together. But what, what would it mean for um, First Nations people? Because I know you've been highly involved in a lot of causes and, and really, you know, uh, in, in contact with with indigenous people and 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 the first nations and 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 making sure that like is is right now trudeau you know i remember him actually a couple of years ago at the when um the tragically hip was giving their their final concerts before uh gord downey passed yeah. away um and uh i i remember him kind of holding him up to the challenge to like you need to take because that was the kind of the battle of his life was to really uh expose all the the, um, the 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 crazy, I mean, atrocities that that have happened to First Nations, and you've been very much involved with with you know causes for that. Uh, what, what would it mean in in a in a sovereign country? Because obviously we we arrived after, and you know this was their land before. What what would it mean in in, in a sovereign Quebec for them? I think what would be the advantage? And second question: Has Trudeau been? you know, held accountable and has, has he been doing a little bit better than the previous administrations? Well, I think native uh, peoples in Quebec, uh, the 11 we count 11 nations in Quebec, I think they, they have everything to gain from a, a sovereign Quebec. Why? If you look historically at uh, the way we negotiated with them and discussed with them, it led to uh, La Paix des Braves, it led to the, the James Bay Convention, which in the world were quite uh, innovative. So I think the way Quebecers as a minority negotiate or talk to other minorities, I think the fact that historically we could maybe feel a bit of what they feel uh, makes us a better counterpart. And I'm convinced that you know the federal Indian law that we have right now, the Indian Act, uh, would be uh, improved and enhanced substantially if Quebec were uh, were to renegotiate that with uh, with with. First Nations in Quebec, and I've actually, I've always thought in my life when I was in politics, I've always thought that if I was to become prime minister one day, one of the one of the functions I would keep for the prime minister is is uh, relations with First Nations, mm -hmm. the way René Lévesque did it as well. So I think it's it's of utmost importance because uh, if we want auto or self determination for Quebec as a minority in, in North America, we have to at least. Uh, 
accept that other minorities on our territory should have some kind of uh, self-determination as well. And I'm convinced that Quebec is the be the best chance they have at gaining what they want, the, the, those first people uh, here. And something that's very sad in Quebec is that if you had a, a Vox Pop, you know, people know better the difference between a Japanese and a Greek in their cultures than between Abenakis here and Micmacs. And, mm -hmm. you know, we live together here and we don't know them at all. It's a, it's a huge paradox to I'm me. I'm totally guilty of that, by the way. Well, it doesn't make... Well, I'm, I'm not saying I'm a specialist and I would tell you the difference between the 11 nations, not at all. But I, I'm saying it's, it's a problem that we, living with them here, don't know the difference between all those nations uh, as, as well as we would between a French guy, a, a Greek guy, and a Spanish guy. We, we could all name some specificities of those cultures, you know, baguette in France and I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, the cliches. Uh, Putin tzatzik, in Quebec. Tzatzik, tzatzik <laughs> in Greece and everything. So, we, and we don't know much about the 11 nations with which we live here. So that, that doesn't make sense at all. We should invest vastly in protecting their languages as well because uh, some of them are not spoken by many people now. So uh, I think there's a lot of do on that on that side of things, and I would love to get involved with that for yeah for sure. Yeah, um, interesting. One thing before we because we're we're going long here. This is fun. Let's just go with the butter chicken and everything. And Bill Murray is being very very <laughs> kind and laying back taking a nap. Um, is it alive? I think he's still alive. Hey, buddy. Maybe not. Maybe you killed my cat. Just passed away while we oh, he's totally zoned out. It's beautiful. Um, there's one very, very important person in your life who passed away not so long ago is uh, Jacques Parizeau. Yep. Um, who, again, I'm going to obviously... Are you going to be devilish? Well, uh, no, but uh, actually, if, if I can just get the devil side out of the way, is a little bit like we were talking about Pauline Marois earlier. There's, there's, um, there's a kind of... The, a one thing headline that that really stuck with him at a key moment uh, during the 1995 referendum yeah. and he was he is the person who brought Quebec to the closest to becoming a country um, said after the defeat which was how, what was the percentage it was like 50 49.4 in favor 40, in favor of, so it was so very 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 half a person close. half a person point yeah. um, and then he, he he walked on stage very famously you can find on YouTube where he uh, he basically said that uh, the reason that we didn't get our country was because of the ethnic vote and because of uh, money. Yeah, actually, what he said uh, literally was because of money and some ethnic votes. And some yeah. ethnic votes, um, which really uh, rubbed people the wrong way, yeah. which maybe didn't right, help. Rightly so, I would say. Yeah, it, it was. I think that was like a, a, obviously a mistake in, in, in his almost impeccable uh, parcours. Um, he's somebody that you admire a lot. I think he admired you very much. So you're very close with his, his wife. Um, and you, you gave a, a, just a gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, almost theatrical speech at his funeral, which just, I mean, completely stole the show and, 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 and was really, really heartfelt and, and, and kind of, uh, signaled your return, eventual return to politics. And also the book that you wrote, uh, La Fin des Exils. Um, which I recommend anyone should should read to get a really clear understanding of of what it would mean for Quebec to become a sovereign sovereign country. Um, as I asked with Pauline Marois, what what you know for the random average Joe again that just knows that one headline knows that yeah. little and w again I, I'm 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 just asking this very very long question, throwing in a bunch of interjections. But you've said which really when I didn't know you, which really appealed to me was that you said you know. Jacques Parizeau said that we didn't get the country because of the ethnic vote and because of of um, of money or some of the ethnic vote was that you said you would like sovereignty uh, because of the ethnic vote and because of money, because <laughs> both make sense and yeah. bo both would be uh, beneficial to the yeah. sovereign movement. So what is, what is the thing that that people or what are the things that people don't know about Jacques Parizeau when, when because they just know this one headline they kind of dismissed him yeah, yeah. and they, well, do, they don't understand how great of an economist and, and, and a mind he yes, was and I think he was he's the top statesman we've had in, in the in the history of Quebec actually he was born in you know firmly in the one percent part of the population he was born from a bourgeois family oh really okay. and he decided to become an economist and a teacher 
and later on decided that he would you know dedicate his life to sovereignty but and he studied uh, elsewhere as well did he yeah he went to london school of economics okay so he he really dedicated his life to public service or most of his adult life to uh Quebec politics and the, even the though idea he could have sovereignty. kicked back and just chilled as he, a one percenter he could have actually followed his father and his brother in the insurance business and you know never be, be very wealthy and not worry about society but he decided uh, i'm not saying that people who do insurance do not worry about society but he, he, he could have chosen a very very much easier way yeah of uh earning a salary let's say but uh i think he was the clearest uh, leader we we had on the advantages of sovereignty and on the fact that if you vote for me you vote for something to happen mm-hmm. for quebec sovereignty he had the courage to say that even though it was harder to win an election you have to be clear and transparent with the population you want to inspire and i think he understood that better than anyone else and he really inspired me uh, in in acting the same way when i run for election it's always with a clear speech and i if people do not do not agree with what I say. My reflex would be to explain them what I mean even more, even more. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I think it's the only way to be a political inspiring leader. But uh, that sentence she said in 95, actually, you know, factly speaking, was not false because the he other was, camp... He was totally right. I mean, there yeah, was, the, it was the, a fact. The no camp really cheated big time. And, you know, if you take only the Lovin we had in Montreal, it was more than both camps' budget. Like we took what, sorry? The Lovin, when all Canadians went oh, to the Lovin. Place du Canada here with big flags and we love you, Don't stay with leave, us. Yeah. Just that was worth more than the legal budgets of the both sides. So it was a huge cheat. Mm-hmm. So money was involved in, in trying to you know, uh, influence the, the debate, that's for sure. And on the ethnic vote side, what he meant is that some communities uh, in Quebec had given a, a kind of... Uh, you know, directions to their constituents to vote massively for the no without explaining anything. And he was hurt by that. Because, you know, some people might say that in Quebec, uh, there is uh, racism, like like everywhere in the world, mm-hmm. in the world, but sorry. But uh, some people these days tend to pretend that Quebecers are racist towards others. Whereas I think in history, if Quebecers have uh, dealt with racism, it was on the side of the victims for a long time. Now, now it's disappeared <coughs> from the landscape and we don't feel that. But for a long time, French-speaking Quebecers were the victims of discrimination, much more so than they imposed it on anyone. Yeah. And I think Parizeau was quite hurt by some communities rejecting the idea that Quebec should be a country and manage its own thing to the benefit of French-speaking populations and those communities as well. And I think that's probably, uh, of course, uh, emotions got in the way in that speech. But I'm, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I'm quite sure if he could, he would take that sentence back or transform it into something less... Uh, radical. Or less, not not yeah. radical, but more of a... yeah Something less... Uh, Harsh. Divisive, actually. Because yeah. 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 actually, the, it, it really hurt the movement itself. And yeah, you know, everybody, everybody would agree with that. But the the foes or the adversaries of the idea can always get back to that sentence and depict the I movement know. as uh, as a little bit you know bigotry and and rednecks and uh, but it's it's so it's so far from reality i've never seen in all my years of uh, political involvement i've never seen in, in all the the meetings where i was someone who would support such ideas of uh, mm. exclusion and and saying, you know, well, which, I mean, there are going to be assholes every, in every, you know. Yeah, there are. I was there, lucky there, 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 not, there's not so to many, them. <laughs> there, there, there's so many people. I mean, there, there are obviously isolated stories of, you know, uh, someone not wanting to serve an English speaking person in the, at the metro or in a hospital because they, you know, they don't speak French and it's like, oh, it's not français ici. Yeah, yeah. And there are all kinds of, you know, in the end, it's, it's really frustrating because it's really about communication and language and just like getting the service you want. And, and, and it, it seems like obviously those are isolated cases and they get sure. blown out of proportion. Just like everywhere. Yeah. Um, but what, when you speak to uh, most people, they, they, they say Quebec is such a welcoming. And so, I mean, oh, yeah, there's yeah. so many examples of an English speaking person who, who will, who will begin, you know, trying to speak in French and the, the Quebecois will automatically switch to English yes, just yes. to accommodate them. And one guy I love to read when, when some people, you know, pretend that Quebecers are, close to the other and, and not open and not welcoming there's one guy i love to read is bukhar mm. he always comes to the rescue of quebecers saying he's he, incredible he's fantastic i would love to have him on he he has to run one day because he's so inspiring do you, do you know him personally yeah 
you, you, you need to tell him about this podcast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I he's would a love fantastic to have guy. That, that would be extremely interesting. And he's so, he's, he knows everything about everything. He should run. He has day. a fantastic brain. I'm, I'm quite sure he will run. One and day. he's very rassembleur. He's very yeah. like, it just, everyone loves him. And, and of course, the fact that he comes from immigration makes him even more rassembleur. Absolutely. Actually. Yeah. And, and I think he, he could help with uh, with communities in Quebec, uh, you know, put forward the idea of uh, mm -hmm. self determination, and that would be more prosperous. Is, is he sovereignist? Yeah. Okay. I think it's generally known that he's in favor of uh, you know Quebec. He loves interests. Quebec. Either. Yeah, 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 and rightly so. He's, he knows how it, how well off we're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love him. So when he comes to the rescue of Quebec, when people start pretending that we're worse than anywhere else, I, I think he's, he's got the right way of saying, uh, slow down people. Uh, Quebec is a fantastic place for all the communities. Well, Jean-Martin, thank you for the butter chicken. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, I wish you, uh, first of all, nothing but... Uh, I mean, is there is there an eventual return to uh, politics one day, or not? I mean, I know that you don't like. Future, I, I have a mandate. I love you're <coughs> with the guild. With the, you're busy with the video game and the video game and, and a few other projects as well. Uh, you know, after, after the defeat in, in October first, on October first, yeah, my way of dealing with it was to accept a lot of projects, not to think about it. So now I have to deal with too many projects, but they're all fascinating and they're all very, uh, yeah, they're all very rewarding as well. So I my I'm very busy now, but very happy. So politics will always be of interest to me. But over the foreseeable future, I'll be working on something else. And what's the so what's the vehicle of the future for Quebec? What, what's the, I mean... My wish is that all vehicles, be they federalist or sovereigntist or environmentalist, have the courage to state their convictions, stick with it during the election, and be voted on or out based on it. Mm -hmm. The day everybody does that, liberal, you know, PQ, Quebec Solidaire, the Greens, any, the CAC, anyone, the day everybody does that, people will gain confidence again, will gain back confidence in their institutions, and they will get back out to vote, and we'll have a functional democratic system, because right now I think it's a bit sick. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to keep going here, with because yeah. we, we didn't even talk about La CAC, uh, yeah. but uh, it seems to me like they don't really stand for that much like it seems like they're, they're the ultimate flip-flop party that will eat like basically gather the votes and you ask anyone who's voted for them like why did you and it it doesn't seem so clear um uh, do they do, do they have any, any any good ideas is there anything that they kind of you know built their platform around where you say well that's actually very interesting uh is francois legault uh, competent in in as a prime minister as a well, representative think, of Quebec. I think he's just as competent as the, one, as the ones we had before. So I, I don't think the weakness is on that side. One thing, and is that the problem? Like, well, it can be. It won't be worse, and it won't be better. It's just kind of like, eh, things are still the same. Well, on the you know on the national question, they decided to put it on the back burner. So uh, the CAC is a, is a combination of sovereigntists and federalists who decided to put that aside for the time being. Yeah, and that's what they they like to describe themselves <coughs> as. A combination of that so i think their mandate will be mostly uh, uh concentrating on, on the economy and de economic development which is one good reason to go into politics but that shouldn't come at the the expense of uh, environmental protection and at the expense of uh, you know, the cultural industries and education but i you know they're they're new in the position so we'll see with time but I think there's no question their interest is lies with Quebec. Their interest lies with Quebec, and I, I think they will defend Quebec's interest in Canada for sure. So we'll, we'll see as time goes by. Jean-Martin, you modern sovereignist, you, you're trilingual, bringing me butter chicken. We're having some Indian flavors here and some American Coca-Cola. <laughs> Talking about Quebec sovereignty is such a pleasure to have you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, so Jason. much for doing the, uh, the, uh, the podcast in English, especially. Yes. And uh, I might get a few emails because of that. You know, I know it's going to be great that the, the your, your, you know, your, your, I might you get a few very, complaints very well. from a few friends. I don't think anyone <laughs> should complain. It's a beautiful thing because you're 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 basically explaining and, and vulgarizing what what is, uh, you know, a, a topic that everyone seems to have an opinion on, but no one's very well informed yeah. on. So I, I know even I did this personally very um selfishly for for my family on the english side who i would love for them to listen to the podcast and whether they agree with it or not doesn't matter but at least for them to hear the message and to, to understand what it would mean for quebec to become a country because it seems like such a 
a, a negative energy for most people in general, but it, it really shouldn't be. It should be more seen more as a liberation and something that's very positive and would not affect people's lives in, in, in a negative way. Actually, there's one thing I want to say. Absolutely. Finish. I totally respect those people who say, I love Canada, I don't want it to split, and mm -hmm. I vote no. But all other reasons to vote no are not founded. So mathematically speaking, yeah. all the rest is in favor of sovereignty. So there are Quebecers who love Canada and want to remain within Canada. But I think a vast majority of those who voted no just need to be reassured in some fears or uncertainties. And it's mathematical that Quebec would be better off. So I hope to convince them one day. You think that there, there are, uh, most pe there's a lot of people out there that are, that are sovereignists and don't even know it probably? Yeah, or don't even know why they should be. Yeah, because mm -hmm. they've been fed by you know, bad coverage in the media or bad politicians on the other side who like to use fear because fear still to that day is the most efficient political tool to, to of course. keep someone from Build a wall. taking a decision. <laughs> well, that's a good example. Actually, he's a daily example of how to use fear out of the border. But uh, fear is, you know, is such there's an a, easy... There's a national emergency with, oh, you know, the, the caravan and... Everything is too big in this speech uh, all the time. Amazing. If I, you know, tremendous. Was, tremendous. Yeah. <laughs> But and the best ever, it's, it's always. But uh, yeah, what, what I mean is that you know, pragmatically speaking, there is no argument uh, against Quebec sovereignty unless you love Canada and want to remain Canadian. But all the rest, we we can. Which, I, fair I'm, enough. I'm confident. I'm confident we'll convince a vast majority of Quebecers one day that they should do their own thing. They just need you to get out of video games and start, you know, spreading need, the love. They need everybody who believes it and has time to explain it and talk about it and exchange about it. They need someone that's good looking and charismatic as you. <laughs> it's it was a pleasure for the third time. <laughs> Thank a, you very much. Done. Thank you.